Hello, you're about to listen to a radio program provided by the Limestone Church of Christ, located in Kingston, Ontario. Please feel free to check us out on the web at lookingunterjesus.net. Hello, we're glad you're listening to our program today. My name is Tom Rainwater, and we have with us two special guests, Keith Sharp and William Stewart. Glad you're here today, gentlemen. Good to be here. Likewise. We're continuing our study today on conversations that Jesus had with different people in the Gospels. This week we'll be talking about Simon the Pharisee, and our context is Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. That's Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Now when we begin looking at what happens here, we have this curious Pharisee named Simon who invited Jesus to dinner. How did that go? And What lessons can we learn from this context? Uh, I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, And she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet, and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon... I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed five hundred denarii and the other fifty. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this? who even forgives sins. Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Thank you for that reading, Keith. And as we just summarized at the beginning of our study today, the things that we're going to look at in the main points of the text, certainly we see love for the Lord and service of the Lord and the forgiveness of the Lord and the relationship that these have one with another. And in the midst of our text, Jesus gives a a small parable in order to teach Simon. But he's not talking about just things in parables. He's talking about Simon and this woman who Simon has identified as a sinner. And he's going to bring that parable to life so that Simon might see where he stands in regard to the Lord as opposed to this woman. Notice that uh, Jesus states the fact that Uh, The one who is forgiven the most loves the most. Now, does that mean that uh, in order to really love the Lord, we need to get out and just sin a whole lot so God will forgive us of a whole lot, so then that will show that we love Him more? Uh, Is that what the Lord is driving at here? Certainly, we don't have to sin a great deal in order to love the Lord, but those who have transgressed the Lord's law more have more to be forgiven of. And therefore, it would, be, it would make sense that their love for the Lord would be so much greater because of the extreme amount they've been forgiven. 
let me just add to this that I really think what the Lord has in mind is that it's not a matter of how much a person has actually sinned. It's a matter of the person's recognition of his sins. Take a man that had a small debt, but he realized he couldn't possibly repay that debt. And if his creditor forgave him, he would have a great deal of gratitude for that. On the other hand, a man that maybe had a large debt but thought, well, someday I'll work this off. Uh, If the creditor forgave him, uh, he wouldn't have as much gratitude or love for the creditor because he thought, well, all right, this is something I could have done myself. And for the person who realizes, I have such a great debt of sin, I can never repay it. That person loves the Lord when he's forgiven by the Lord. So I believe the point is, it's not really how much we have sinned, it's how cognizant we are of our sins and of the fact that we can never pay that debt off by ourselves. Now, I think in this case, Keith, the woman definitely knew or was aware of the sin in her life and was ashamed of that. She definitely demonstrated that when she came in and, and showed Jesus hospitality. In fact, this is hospitality that Simon didn't even give Jesus. It was customary in that time that when you came into somebody's house, you, you wash their feet. And Simon hadn't done that, apparently. We have no idea if the woman was invited. Probably not, because they were shocked that she was even there, so they considered her a sinner and so forth. And uh, she comes in there, and uh, now she's the center of attention as they're watching her. She's kissing his feet, and she's using her hair and tears to wash his feet. And she knows who Jesus is. Now, Simon may not fully understand seems like he's skeptical, but the woman knows. She knows that Jesus is the one to go to in regard to sin. It also was a characteristic of the Pharisees to be self-righteous. And although it's not specifically stated here of Simon that he was self-righteous, the way he reacted to this woman and also reacted to how the Lord reacted to the woman is a demonstration of his self-righteousness. He obviously would not have allowed the woman to touch him. Uh, He he said that if if this were really a prophet, if Jesus were really a prophet, then uh, he would have known that this is a sinful woman and and who is touching him. And, of course, the the Pharisees, in their self-righteousness, not only would not touch a sinner, if their garments actually brushed against a sinner or something that a sinner had touched, uh, while they were in the public uh, marketplace, would go home and change their clothes and, and, and take a bath. They get uh, somehow rid of the defilement of having touched a sinner. And so it's obvious that uh, Simon partook of the self righteousness of the Pharisees, of whom he was one. And so he wouldn't have had any recognition of any need to be forgiven by the Lord. And so, as we've seen in the reading of this passage, Simon the Pharisee is trying to determine whether or not Jesus is from God. And he comes to a wrong conclusion. What exactly was wrong with his approach? Well, first of all, Tom, we don't know why Simon invited uh, Jesus to dine with him. Uh, He may have been curious about Jesus, and it seems by the context that he was. If we back up to verse 16, it says that fear came upon all, And they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him went throughout all Judea and all the surrounding region. And so no doubt Simon had heard this report, and therefore maybe he's curious. He wants to investigate this Jesus of Nazareth to see whether the things reported of him are true. Now, from the very beginning of their meeting here, the very beginning of their dinner time, uh, as you've already pointed out, Simon withheld common courtesies. He wasn't going to open his doors and open his heart to this one. Uh, He held back some. uh, As he didn't wash Jesus' feet, he didn't give him a kiss, he didn't anoint him, uh, as would be customary uh, among people. But then we come to that conclusion that, uh, that Simon makes in verse 39, He says of Jesus that this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Now, if he hadn't already fashioned his opinion, certainly he's made it known now. 
he looks at Jesus and he says, either he lacks the ability to know what kind of woman this is, or he lacks the holiness to separate himself from such a woman, allowing her to touch him. And so he's made a judgment based upon the actions of Jesus and allowing this woman to continue in what she's doing and washing his feet with her tears and wiping his feet with her hair. He's made a judgment of Jesus that he cannot be a prophet of God because look what he's doing. Now, our brother Keith has talked about the self-righteousness of the Pharisees and that, of course, is coming through in Simon. So, William, as you're pointing out, Simon's entire approach to the Lord was based on his self-righteousness. He could not recognize that he was a sinner who needed to be forgiven just as that woman was who came in. And therefore, he could not love the Lord as he should have loved him because of his very self-righteousness. And of course, obviously, there's a great lesson to be learned there. Uh, If we think that we've earned our righteousness and we can stand before God acceptable in the last great day because of how good we've been, then we're not going to appreciate the Lord's sacrifice for us. We're not going to appreciate what God has done for us in the giving of His Son. We're not going to love Him as we ought to love Him if we have that self-righteous attitude that Simon obviously had. And the evidence here, gentlemen, is that Jesus did know a lot about the woman. Simon thought he didn't know anything about her. But Jesus knew everything about her. When he talked about her sins, which are many, are forgiven. He knew all about her past life. He knew all of what she needed to be forgiven of. And he knew not only her and her past, but her heart. And also Simon's heart. So Jesus knew, knew everything if Simon would honestly and objectively look at what Jesus said. It's striking that the person at that table who truly was righteous was Jesus. If anyone at that table really did have the right because of his righteousness and the woman's sinfulness to refuse to associate with her, it would have been the Lord. But the Lord was the one at that table who did allow her to have contact with him that he might lead her to God. And of course, there's a great lesson to be learned there also. Uh, Jesus constantly both amazed and offended the Jewish leaders because he would be around the tax collectors and the sinners. He ate and drank with the tax collectors and the sinners was one of the charges that was made against the Lord. Yes, that's true. He did that not because he was partaking of their sins, but in order to lead them to God. And, of course, we should be the same. And so if one truly is righteous in the sight of God, that's not an excuse to have nothing to do with sinful people. But rather, it becomes that much more reason to have contact with them in order to lead them to the Lord. And as we said, the woman was much easier to lead to the truth than that self-righteous Pharisee. And when we look at what Jesus said to her in verse 48, your sins are forgiven, I mean, that's why Jesus was here, for the forgiveness of sins. He wasn't there to please the Pharisees. He wasn't there to show everybody how they ought to observe the traditions of the, of the elders. He was there because he loved people, he loved sinners, and he wanted to provide a way in which they could be forgiven. Now, gentlemen, after... Jesus had turned to the woman, verse 48, and said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Let's take a look at verse 49 and the reaction of those who were sitting there at the table as well. It says, And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Now, we had mentioned earlier that the report had gone throughout the land that Jesus was a prophet, that God had visited his people through this one. And yet now the people are starting to question a little bit more. Uh, Is he just a prophet? Here he is forgiving sins. Back in Mark chapter 2, we find a a similar type of situation where a paralytic was brought to Jesus and uh, brought to be healed. And when the paralytic was, was dropped down before him, Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Verse 5 of Mark chapter 2. 
Verse 6, some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, their reaction was wrong. Their conclusion about who can forgive sins was right. The forgiveness of sins belongs to God alone. But what Jesus, by forgiving this man's sins, by forgiving this woman's sins, and in other instances saying to others that their sins were forgiven of them, he is plainly declaring that he is not just a prophet come amongst the people, but that he indeed is God in the flesh, that he indeed is God with us. And when we go down to the next verse in verse 50, the, the last statement in this context where Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. He talks about faith being connected with salvation. What kind of faith is he talking about here, Keith? Well, the woman's faith caused her to do some things. And uh, that is that she demonstrated both her faith and her love uh, by the things that she did in uh, the anointing of the Lord's feet with the ointment from the alabaster box. And, of course, we know that would have been very expensive ointment. So she made a great sacrifice. Uh, and, of course, the uh, washing uh, his feet with her tears and wiping them with the hair of her head, all of those were uh, acts demonstrating both love and humility on her part, appreciation, and also uh, showing that uh, she recognized Jesus for whom he was, uh, and, and therefore it was a demonstration by what she did of her faith. So it was not... Uh, uh, what people today would call faith alone. It was not a faith that did not demonstrate itself in action, but it was a faith that demonstrated itself in action. And thus it was saving faith. Now, let me just add this, though. Uh, it is true that the Lord while on earth had the power to forgive sins. Uh, and uh, sometimes people bring this up as a, a reason to get around baptism. Say, well, this woman wasn't baptized, but the Lord forgave her sins, so we can be uh, forgiven without uh, being baptized. Well, while the Lord was on earth, having been given power by his Father to forgive sins, he could forgive sins uh, on whatever basis he judged appropriate. But now that he's died and gone back to heaven, now his will is in place, and the necessity of water baptism for the remission of sins is a part of his will that is now in place. No one has the right uh, to act in, in place of the Lord and to forgive sins apart from the terms of his will. And we can say that faith in God has been required of every person in every age. Since Jesus' appearance, faith in Christ as the Son of God is absolutely necessary. And as you said, Keith, to obey the commands that were given. Now, gentlemen, the last words there in verse 50, uh, Jesus says, Go in peace. Uh, it would be easy for us to just read past those and on into the next chapter and, and not really focus a great deal on that. But let's stop for a moment. This woman has come to Jesus with her sinfulness. She came to him and had tears and washed his feet with those tears, wiped his feet with her hair. She was not in peace when she came to him. But having received the forgiveness of sins, she can walk away with peace and comfort. On the other hand, the one who invited him here, Simon, he has no peace. Simon is still in his sins. Simon has not shown any love. This woman has done everything that Simon ought to have done. And Simon left all those things undone. Simon has shown contempt for the Lord, not love. And so here he is listening to Jesus speak to the woman, says, your faith has saved you, go in peace. And there's no peace for Simon at all. He's in turmoil, whether he knows it or not. Certainly his sin is still there, and he can't feel good about having invited Jesus in what he has seen. There's no peace for him because he's unforgiven. There's peace for those who serve the Lord and who stand forgiven in his presence. God's love for us uh, is shown in the giving of His Son. Of course, the passage that everyone remembers as the golden text of the Bible, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Uh, and, of course, that adverb of degree, God so loved the world. And then the, the extent of that love is shown. Uh, he gave His only begotten Son to die for us. And so we have to realize the greatness of God's love for us. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, John says, We love Him because He first loved us. When someone has shown to us great love and we realize the greatness of that love, then that leads us to reciprocate that love, to love them in return. And if we realize how much God has done for us and how much we need what He has done for us, then that will lead us to love Him as we should. As long as we have in our mind that we're really pretty good people, uh, that uh, we don't really need the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that we're all right as we are, that uh, we've been good enough that we ought to be able to stand before God in the last great day and and hear well done because we've lived such a good life. As long as we have that self-righteous attitude, then we will never have the love for God and for His Son that we ought to have into realizing that there's not any way that we could repay the debt that we have uh, brought upon ourselves because of our sins, that that debt is far beyond our ability to repay, and therefore we must always appreciate and love God for what He's done for us through His Son. Now, when we talk about this woman washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping with her hair, it's significant to note that it was typical of a servant before their master in those days to use their hair in order to wipe their master's feet. And so what her actions are declaring about Jesus is that she considered him to be her master, that she was submitting herself as a servant before him. Now, in the parable that Jesus gives, the two debtors, he says that the one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. One denarius would amount to a day's wage. And so we're talking about debts that amount to 500 days' wages and 50 days' wages. Now, he says of both debts that they had nothing with which to repay. Neither debt could be repaid. But imagine being the one who owes the 500 denarii instead of the 50. As our brother Keith had mentioned, you would appreciate the forgiveness of that debt, given the magnitude of the debt. You would appreciate the, the forgiveness of that debt, understanding that you could never repay. And so Jesus endeavors to show Simon the need for forgiveness, both for himself and for this woman. Simon looks only at the woman and she's the sinner. Simon needs to understand he's in this parable too. Jesus is not just talking about the woman. They're both there. From an absolute standpoint, it may have been a perfect apropos that uh, Simon be represented by uh, someone who owed 50 denarii, whereas the woman... 500 in Arii. Obviously, as far as sinning, violating God's law, uh, this sinful woman would have committed more sins. At least she was much more cognizant of having committed more sins. Uh, But regardless, whether it's a person who sinned uh, just a few times in their life or a person who has sinned uh, every day many, many times, uh, neither way can they repay that debt that they have to God. This woman has come to Jesus overwhelmed by her sinfulness. She came to him and had tears and washed his feet with those tears, wiped his feet with her hair. She was not in peace when she came to him. But having received the forgiveness of sins, having heard her Savior, her Master say, your sins are forgiven you, she can walk away with peace and comfort. She considered him to be her Master that she was submitting herself as a servant before him. Jesus.